Hello everyone! Welcome to my Final Fantasy Timeline 3 Part 6. For those who love the Final Fantasy franchise and want a brief summary of my 5 part timeline theory, this video is for you. Parts 1 through 5, I'll be re-uploading after this video with better voice music balance. I know a little backwards, but hey, I'm excited to start this series again with this video. Parts 1 through 5 are presented in a storytelling format with summaries at the end of each part, and of course, since I'm discussing the flow from one game to another, there are major spoilers. I tried to limit the spoilers in this video while still thoroughly explaining my timeline theory. Even so, for those who haven't played through any or all the games completely but are still intrigued, this video is also for you. Final Fantasy is a series of games created by Japanese video game developer Square. The first game, Final Fantasy 1, was released in 1987 and since then, 15 other main title games and plenty of sequels and spin-offs have followed. You play as Warriors of Light, who in most installments possess crystals or magical powers that can combat evil forces of their world, presenting themes of love, self-sacrifice, and rebellion. Of course, with time, the storytelling has evolved to shine light on issues our world faces, such as conflicts between man's technological advancements at the expense of nature, interpersonal conflicts, such as discovering our identities, our life's purpose, and our religious faith while prompting questions such as, is something purely and truly good or purely and truly evil? Many newcomers always ask, is Final Fantasy one long into this game with each title a sequel to the last? And the answer is no. They are standalone games unless otherwise indicated like for Final Fantasy X and for Final Fantasy X 2 its sequel. Others also ask, are the games connected since they share so many of the same story elements and even characters? I would say yes. Square Enix has already confirmed that Final Fantasy X is set before Final Fantasy VII, albeit on different planets and thousands of years apart. So this made me wonder about the other games. What other in-game illusions could connect these titles and is there a way to organize them in a chronological order? This led me to dive deep into the lore of the Final Fantasy games, gaining as much information as I could using the internet, looking for Ultimedia translations, which give players extra information, but you're usually um, presented in Japanese, so we need, of course, we need English translations. And also, I've played through most, if not all, the games myself. With this, I started to piece each game in chronological order as I saw fit. For my timeline there, I started from Final Fantasy XI and end with Final Fantasy XIII, XV kind of mixed together, and Final Fantasy VIII. Here in this image, I depict the flow from one game to another. I know it looks confusing, so let me orient you. Starting from Final Fantasy XI, within the top red circle, you follow the blue arrow to Final Fantasy XIV, VI, and then XII. The red circle that encases three of these games is meant to represent the rift, or as, as it's called, will be which I'll explain more soon. The games not encased in the red circle are the rest of the universe, and this is called World A. As you may have noticed, some titles have red numbers next to them. This is meant to represent the main physical planets of the universe made after the events of Final Fantasy XI and Final Fantasy XIV. Final Fantasy VI would become known as Planet R from Final Fantasy V. Final Fantasy XII is Ivalice, Final Fantasy X is Spira, Final Fantasy VII is Gaia, Final Fantasy II is the fifth planet or red planet, and Final Fantasy IV is the blue planet. While well, last but not least, Final Fantasy XV is Eos. Back to the arrows. The blue one flows from Final Fantasy XI, 14, 6, 12, 1, 5, 3, then to 2 with our divergence to Final Fantasy XV from Final Fantasy V. From Final Fantasy X, the green arrow goes to Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy XV, III, and then VIII. Lastly, a pink arrow flows from Final Fantasy II to IV, IX, and XIII, and it's kind of spin-off dual title called Type O, with a divergence of Final Fantasy XV from Final Fantasy II and Final Fantasy XIII. With this in order, sit back as we deep dive into the Final Fantasy universe, starting at the time of creation. In the beginning, there is a realm called the Crystal World, which resides at the center of the universe. The Crystal World was once in a perfect balance of light and darkness, one crystal, the original crystal, of red and blue light. 
The crystal world was a life force of harmony and discord. To keep the forces separate yet balanced, the void and the interdimensional rift was created by splitting the crystal in two. The void became the source of chaos and holds the dark crystal, Zodiac. The rift became the source of time and holds the light crystal, Hadaline. The crystal world is the source of the cosmos and holds the dormant fragmented original crystal. From the void, plants were born and from the crystal world, life was born. Four elemental spirits are born from the light crystal, fire, water, earth, and air. Four demons are born of the dark crystal, the four fiends. A powerful demon dragon named Shinryu manifested in chaos. Hadalim summons Shinryu to the interdimensional rift where he is given the task of collecting and preserving memories of all the worlds connected to the rift, or world B. The fiends are tasked with protecting Shinryu. If the world should die, it would be reborn from the memory Shinryu holds and from the dark and light crystals coming together briefly to awaken the original crystal so it can birth the mother crystal for a new world. Over time, knowledge and memories build up and the humans advance to form its own complex society with deities and fiends in the crosshairs of an ongoing conflict between light, dark, man, machine, and magic. Leading to Final Fantasy XI. Hadalim ascends the crystal world and uses the Aether Era Zero from Final Fantasy XIV to create world crystals. It takes time for them to gain enough energy and memories to be used. In the meantime, Hadalim uses her power to start a new world with a new life cycle. When life expires, the memories return to the world crystal and the rift, and the souls to the void. When the world crystal dies, the light or memories flows to the crystal world to invade the chaos in order to trigger the expulsion of life and light, or the Big Bang. A new world will be born from the void, expelling light, and a new crystal from the crystal world will start the life cycle anew. When world A is born of the void, humans are created by Hedalee to give energy to the dormant world crystals in the rift. However, from the dark crystal, chaos energy will seep from the void and into this world to disrupt its life cycle by creating fiends from the flora and fauna. They are similar monsters in world B, but these fiends were humans who refused to die or died horrible deaths, animals and plants possessed by the chaos energy. The first world born would be known as Planet R, which is the home planet for the games Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy I, Final Fantasy V, and Final Fantasy III. During the first void birth, the Warring Triad is transported to World A, where they are fully awakened. The mist, which is the embodiment of magic in the soul of the rift, empowered the world of Ivalice from Final Fantasy XII and gave more power to the chaos energy, which is miasma or darkness. It starts to invade the rift and the world of light, world A. Shimiyu is consumed by the miasma. It convoluted time in the rift and started to steal memories, creating amnesia. A high concentration of miasma manifested into a dark crystal of chaos possessing dark magic of Kefka, the Warring Triad, and Chaos. Shimiyu travels the rift with the Dark Crystal to World A and takes Chaos with him, which is the beginnings of Final Fantasy I. Continuing to steal memories, also the will and the mind of any creature encounters, Shimiyu can plague World A with darkness by corrupting souls, thus allowing Chaos and the Void to overtake the mortal world, the rift, and the light half of the Mother Crystal. Cosmos creates Omega, a being who can combat Shimiyu and is drawn to its presence. More worlds were born from the Void. Hanalin used the Metasite of the Rift to give birth to the fifth planet of Final Fantasy II in which only humans and fiends inhibit. There are no deities. One planet born of a pure chaos was Gaia of Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy VIII in which Zodiac creates a powerful sorcerer deity named Hein to shape the world only inhabited by monsters. Hein creates humans to do his bidding but gives them little instruction on what to do. Hanalin conjures up mist to create a life force for this planet and its conscience, a deity she named Minerva. Minerva would provide the human crystals called Materia. Another world, Final Fantasy X, was created using an enhanced form of magicite and orbs called spheres. All introduced magic into the human worlds. Hanalin creates the blue planet of Final Fantasy IV with no mother crystal 
in the hopes that World B's and World A's memories wouldn't influence their evolution. Her intentions were undermined with the introduction of the creator's crystals. Memoria of Final Fantasy IX is a realm that manifested as an alternative to Shinryu. It holds a collection of the plant's memories that haven't returned to the crystal world yet, waiting to be reborn. It's much like the live stream of the other guy of Final Fantasy VII, the far plane of Spira in Final Fantasy X, and the heaven of the fifth planet of Final Fantasy II. They travel through to this new rift that leads to the crystal world. Here you can find the crystal of the universe from the beginning of time. The planet of Terra falls towards the planet of Gaia in Final Fantasy IX and remains buried until the crystal world spawns new deities and are tasked with renewing this planet and connecting it to the new rift. Valhalla of Final Fantasy XIII. Eos of Final Fantasy XV was created as a planet in the rift from the pure light of Hadalane. To avoid darkness seeping into the world and corrupting souls, Eos made it into a dream world of the light crystal, with no connection to the rift other but to other realms. The crystal realm is where the astros reside and where the soul of the departed wait before being channeled to the unseen realm or the void where other deities wait to rebirth the souls into the dream world. With that introduction to some of the key events and characters, let's get into the specifics. For the first timeline flow, this will be following the blue arrows from the original image that I showed you. We are going to start at Final Fantasy XI and the planet of Vanadil, which was the first planet created and introduced us to the Mother Crystal, which creates elemental deities, the summons of the Final Fantasy games such as Ifrit and Shiva. The Mother Crystal was divided into the Light and Dark Crystal, Hadeline and Zodiac respectively, as told in Final Fantasy XIV's World Era Zero, leading to my proposed world life cycle involving the crystal world, world A, world B, the rift, and the void, and of course the inclusion of the summons and humans. This time flow is covered with more depth in part one of this timeline series. The main event leading from Final Fantasy XIV to Final Fantasy VI is the creation of the Warring Triad. The goddess, the fiend, and the demon were powerful primals or summons in the world of Final Fantasy XIV as located in World B, they traveled to the planet of Final Fantasy VI located in World A. I chose Final Fantasy VI to photo Final Fantasy XII next, based on how the game ended, in which the planet lost magic. It had to go somewhere, back to the rift, and these games both introduced the concepts of mist and magicite. Mist is a great source of magical energy in the Final Fantasy universe, and magicites are stones of this mist. So Kefka's magic was lost to the rift and fueled the development of Ivelisse and its deities of Final Fantasy XII. In the Final Fantasy universe, Mist is a benevolent manifestation of magic while its malevolent counterpart is Miasma, which leads to Final Fantasy I in World A and its origins in the fighting made game Final Fantasy Dissidia, which is set in World B. Now the city is important because it is the game that actually introduced the concept of World A and World B. Final Fantasy 1 was the first installment of the Final Fantasy series where we are getting introduced to key characters such as Shinryu, Omega, Chaos, and Cosmos which essentially are creating this light and dark crystals or light and dark forces within the World A. Cosmos controlling Mist and Chaos controlling Miasma. Omega was created to combat Shinryu, in which Shinryu is a creature that consumes memories, as told in Final Fantasy Dissidia. I believe its original purpose was to preserve the memories for the world verse, if that's just my opinion. Anyways, Magic returned to Final Fantasy VI and Final Fantasy I, since they again they are in the same world, through the presence of these orbs and the creation of Warriors of Light of Final Fantasy I to combat the darkness of chaos. Leading from Final Fantasy I to Final Fantasy V, the main story elements that caught my eye were the awareness of the Rift, the Void, and the continuation of the Warriors of Light and the Light Crystals. But now in Final Fantasy V, we have introduction of two sets of Light Crystals, which seem to be the perfect setup for Final Fantasy III, which introduces 
the dark crystals, dark warriors, and devastating floods of light and darkness. And of course, staples of the Final Fantasy series are introduced in Final Fantasy V, such as Gilgamesh, who is considered a traveler of the rift, meaning he has various appearances in other Final Fantasy games. This time flow is covered with more depth in part 2 of this series, which covers Final Fantasy VI, 1, and 12, and part 4, which covers Final Fantasy V and 3. On to the next set. As you can see, I have the world of Final Fantasy 2 and Final Fantasy 3 coming into play leading to the events of Final Fantasy 4. Final Fantasy 2 was a bit tricky to place. In this game, we are introduced to a world without summons, but Magicite is used to wield magic, which is a close cousin to Final Fantasy 6 and Final Fantasy 12, which also has the use of Magicite. Final Fantasy 2 also has four special crystals. These crystals were elemental crystals, but they're a bit different in which they boost the stats of your party members, which led me to believe that they were a different form of crystal than the light and dark ones of the previous world of Final Fantasy 6 and 1. This led me to the connection between Final Fantasy 3 and 4 involving these special crystals. Final Fantasy 4 has 16 crystals total. 8 are on its red moon and 8 are on the blue planet. The 8 on the moon are used for a sealing purpose while the 8 on the planet are 4 light and 4 dark crystals. The crystals on the blue planet are not the 8 light and dark crystals from Final Fantasy 3 but are sourced from a character I believe originated in Final Fantasy 3, Owen. Owen has been described as an ancient, powerful being and scientist that created the tower to keep the world's floating continent stable in Final Fantasy III. He invented a device to place his son in a cryogenic sleep and his son was named Desh, who is one of the main characters of Final Fantasy III and could very well too fit into the following proposed connection between Final Fantasy III and Final Fantasy IV. Not much else was mentioned about Owen in Final Fantasy III However, a character from Final Fantasy IV may expand his story. Remember, the planet R of Final Fantasy III went through floods of darkness and light that devastated the planet. I believe this continued and the planet was in ruin, but Owen survived, maybe putting himself into a cryogenic sleep. He used the remains of the planet to travel the universe and create special crystals to study evolution. The character from Final Fantasy IV that would foot these events is the creator. As described on the Final Fantasy Wiki, the creator is the last surviving member of a species that once prospered on a distant edge of the universe, but ultimately destroyed its own civilization. Concerned about whether evolution is a necessity and wishing to conduct experiments, the creator created a host of crystals capable of recording the history of a world and distributed them upon planets which held the promise of life, including the blue planet. I believe that this was the fate of Planet R, and Owen is the one who created the true moon vessel from Planet R's remains, and is now being called the creator who provided the crystals for the blue planet of Final Fantasy IV. Furthermore, these crystals made it to other planets and even traveled through time to earlier stages of Planet R, such as Final Fantasy I, Final Fantasy II, and Final Fantasy V. Why do I think this? There is a certain point in Final Fantasy IV where you battle fiends specifically from other Final Fantasy games, which include Final Fantasy 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6. Speaking of Final Fantasy 2, I believe they received Owen's crystals too, and these were the crystals the Red Moon inherited. The people of Final Fantasy 2 became the Lunarians of Final Fantasy 4. The lore behind the True Moon states, at some point, the True Moon visited the fifth planet in the solar system and left crystals on it. The planet would eventually he destroyed and the Lunarians fled to Earth, creating a second moon to live on. This thus establishing the blue planet of Final Fantasy IV, the red moon that came from Final Fantasy II, and the true moon that came from Final Fantasy III, all connected through these special crystals. The rest of this timeline is pretty straightforward. Flow from Final Fantasy IV to IX is introduced through the planets of Gaia and Terra. Terra being much older than Gaia, which is in line with Gaia being the blue planet of Final Fantasy IV and Terra being the red moon of Final Fantasy IV. Interestingly, Gaia has two moons, one originating from Gaia and another from Terra. This is a nod to the blue planet and the red moon of Final Fantasy IV. 
Furthermore, an in-between world was introduced, Memoria, which actually is the best connection to the crystal world and the mother crystal as shown in Final Fantasy IX. It serves as a rift location in this world, a concept seen in other Final Fantasy games which in my timeline occurred before Final Fantasy IX. The Far Plane of Final Fantasy X, the Lashu of Final Fantasy VII, and the Heaven Hell of Final Fantasy II. An important thing to note is Final Fantasy IX pays homage to many other Final Fantasy titles with allusions to Garland and the Four Fiends from Final Fantasy I, Pandemonium from Final Fantasy II, Parallels to Necron and Cloud of Darkness from Final Fantasy III, The Blue Planet and Red Moon of Final Fantasy IV, Gilgamesh and Enkidu of Final Fantasy V, The Warring Triad of Final Fantasy VI, A Life Cycle similar to Gaia of Final Fantasy VII, and the concept of, the, of clones, The Mist of Final Fantasy XII, and not any key allusions that Final Fantasy IX has to other games or games that I placed after Final Fantasy IX in my timeline. Final Fantasy VIII, Final Fantasy XIII, and Final Fantasy XV. Lastly, Final Fantasy IX flows to Final Fantasy XIII as to explain the origins of Pulse and the floating continent of Cocoon in Final Fantasy XIII. Naturally, the Red Moon Terra would become Cocoon that floats above the land of Pulse, which originated from the blue planet Gaia. Valhalla from Final Fantasy XIII is like Memoria from Final Fantasy IX. This is covered with more depth at the end of part 3, which covers Final Fantasy II, with a whole video of part 4, which covers Final Fantasy III, IV, and IX, and the beginning of part 5 of this timeline theory, which covers Final Fantasy XIII. Now, on to the last set. Finally, we tackle a timeline that started it all, Final Fantasy X to Final Fantasy VII. The main connection being a character introduced in Final Fantasy X's sequel, X-2, a boy named Shinra. As Square explains it, Shinra of Final Fantasy X-2 is a boy who studied the Far Plane, which is the afterlife location of this world, and came up with the concept of extracting energy from the Far Plane. And this is the same method that we see from the Shinra company in Final Fantasy VII, which in which they extracted energy from their planet by tapping into the life stream, which is the afterlife and lifeblood of the planet of Gaia. In a quote by Kazushige Nojima, the main scenario writer for Final Fantasy X, he states, After quitting the Gullwings, Shimmer received enormous financial support from Rin and began trying to use Vegnagun to siphon Mako energy from the Fire Plane, but he is unable to complete the system for utilizing this energy in his generation and in the future when traveling to distant planets becomes possible the Shimra company is founded on another world or something like that that would happen probably about a thousand years after the story i think end quote quoting from final fantasy ultimania Shimra learned the origins of the fiends of spira and how they existed before life on spira did and resided in a fiend world this bit of information was the main driver for this timeline sequence. These modifications to Vegnagun, I believe, led to the creation of Omega from Final Fantasy VII, a being that when the planet is in danger, can gather up all the life force of the planet and fly away to a new one and establish a new life there. I believe that Genova is a parasitic form of Unalaska, searching for a planet to take over. To connect Final Fantasy X and VII to Final Fantasy XV, Final Fantasy 3 and Final Fantasy 8. Final Fantasy 7 flows into Final Fantasy 15 through the connection of the Diamond Weapon, Meteor, and Parasite. All three are major plot elements in both games. Like Final Fantasy 9, Final Fantasy 15 has many allusions to the other games, which made me place it after Final Fantasy 7 in most other titles. Final Fantasy 15 in World B since it is influenced by so much. Magitek from Final Fantasy VI, Gilgamesh and Omega from Final Fantasy V, Knights of the Round from Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy XIV, Demons from Final Fantasy II and Final Fantasy V, Warriors of Light from Final Fantasy I, and even the concept of summons having an actual role in the plot of the game like it is seen in Final Fantasy IX, VI, and IV. Since Final Fantasy XV only has a few summons who were gods of Eos and one crystal that was created later on in the game's timeline, 
I believe Eos was an attempt to create a world different from the others, but closely resembles Final Fantasy XI and Final Fantasy IX in its setup. In other words, the forces that be, the Miss Universe, are making another attempt at creating an ideal world. However, the events that occur in Final Fantasy XV would unfold similarly to the first planet of World A, Final Fantasy VI. Final Fantasy XV and Final Fantasy VII flow to Final Fantasy III with the thought that the demons of Final Fantasy XV were cleansed from Eos in World B but banished to World A. The fate of the true moon for Final Fantasy III is that it departed the blue planet as an empty vessel. You know who's looking for an empty vessel? Genova of Final Fantasy VII. A being that can create monsters, Genova probably welcomed the demons of Eos. Now in command of the true moon, she plagues the world of Gaia, which is Final Fantasy VIII and Final Fantasy VII. Before we get into that, let's review the origins of Final Fantasy VIII. As a recap, again quoting from the Final Fantasy X-2 Ultimania, Shimmer learned the origins of fiends of Spira and how they existed before life on Spira did and resided in a fiend world. This fiend world may have been another planet. The lore of Final Fantasy VIII states that, this, that the world was occupied by fiends and the god or sorcerer Hein combated them but grew tired, so he created humans as tools to do the work for him before going into a long, deep sleep. I believe that during his slumber is when events of Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy VII unfold. I place the main events of Final Fantasy VII before Final Fantasy VIII because I believe the Ketra were the tools Hein created and they shaped Gaia. That drive to advance society in Final Fantasy VII by the Shinra Company persisted in Final Fantasy VIII where they now have floating and movable settlements, can travel to space, and have underwater research facilities as well. And the magic the Ketra used wasn't restricted to a certain type of person, aka a female sorcerer, like in Final Fantasy VIII. Who, may I point out, don't look too human in some instances leading me to believe that they're an evolved species. Again, putting Final Fantasy VIII at a later time point than Final Fantasy VII. With that said, when Hein awakens and goes through a whole ordeal is when the events that lead up to Final Fantasy III occur, as Hein is summoned from the Void to Final Fantasy III's planet. From that point until the first lunar cry, the events of Final Fantasy II, IV, IX, and XV occur. The lunar cry is a phenomenon where monsters from the moon of Gaia descend from a pillar and perform a concentrated strike on the planet which can destroy civilizations. This moon, I believe, to be the true moon occupied by Genova, who is siphoning monsters, demons, fiends, whatever you want to call them, from the rift in an attempt to successfully destroy Gaia. Lastly, the cleansed world of Final Fantasy XV becomes the world lightning finds yourself in at the end of Final Fantasy XIII. Final Fantasy XV's Eos became what we know as Earth. And this world, lightning doesn't find the gods of the Final Fantasy universe. Just us. And that pretty much wraps up this flow chart. If you're wondering who all these people and things are, again, a more in-depth analysis is in part 3 for Final Fantasy X, 7, and 2, and part 5, which covers Final Fantasy 13, 15, and 8 of my Timeline Theory videos. So finally, I am able to put the main title games of the Final Fantasy series in a chronological order-ish, as you can see here. Essentially, each of the worlds in the Final Fantasy games were set up a certain way and we see their progression through different games in which the game's main events are thousands of years apart from another. With that said, I do believe all the Final Fantasy games are part of the same universe. Some occur in different dimensions, some don't. Some may occur around the same time, but on a different planet, and some games share the same planet just at different points in time. And thus concludes my Final Fantasy Timeline Theory. I can't wait until the next installment to see where I can fit it in. Let me know your connections. I know I didn't cover all the spin-off titles such as Crystal Chronicles or Tactics, but I can probably squeeze them in there nicely. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. I would love to hear your connections and how you think these games should be arranged. Like, share, and subscribe. Also, I'll be starting another project soon. There'll be a Final Fantasy Kingdom Hearts crossover. Be on the lookout for that. I hope you enjoy this Timeline Theory series and will enjoy my next one. Thank you and take care.